What do we think about when we think about football? Football is about so many things, so many complex, contradictory, and conflicting things. Memory, history, place, social class, gender, in all of its troubled variations, family identity, tribal identity, national identity, the nature of groups, both groups of players and groups of fans, and the often violent, but sometimes pacific and quietly admiring relation between our group and other groups. Football is a tactical game. Football, soccer, is a tactical game. Obviously, it requires discipline, obviously, and relentless training to maintain the fitness of the players, but more importantly, to attain and retain the shape of the team. A team, what is a team? A team is a grid, a dynamic figuration, a matrix of moving nodes, endlessly shifting, but all the while trying to keep its shape to retain its form. A team is a mobile shifted form pitted against another form, that of the opposing team. The purpose of the shape of the team, regardless of possession, regardless of whether you play offensively or defensively, is to occupy and control space. The way a football team tries to control space has obvious analogies with the policing of space and the militarization of space, whether in terms of attack or retreat, occupation, or siege. A football team should be organized like a small army. Compact, unified, mobile, skilled force with a clear chain of command. As many have said before, football is the continuation of war by other means. But the means of football are clearly bellicose. It's about victory and sometimes, often, heroic defeat. As Bill Shankly, Bill Shankly, just hear that name, see that granite-like face. My boyhood hero and legendary football, Liverpool Football Club manager from 1959 to 74 said, Shankly, football is about basic things. Control the ball and pass, control and pass, control and pass, all the time. When controlling and passing is combined with movement and speed, where after each pass, there are two or three options open to the player with the ball, that eventually the team with the ball will score. And whoever scores most wins. It's as simple as that. But as the late, great Johan Cruyff said, playing football is very simple, but playing simple football is the hardest thing there is. Unlike sports like golf and tennis, and even baseball, cricket, and basketball. Football is not individualistic. Although there is no doubt there's a celebrity-driven star system where players demand and exert ever-increasing amounts of financial autonomy, football is not just about individual players. Even Alexis Sanchez. No matter how gifted they might be, it's about the team. Football is essentially collaborative. It's about movement between players who play together and play with and for each other and who make up the mobile spatial web of a team. Now, a team can be made up of truly gifted players like Barcelona or less gifted indiv individuals who function together as a fused group, an effective unit of self-organization where each player knows exactly the role they play in the overall formation of the team. I think of teams like Leicester City in the English Premier League in 2015-16, who really gave football back to the fans, or a team like Costa Rica in the 2014 World Cup, or Iceland in the 2016 European Championship, and watch Iceland in 2018. They will do something at the World Cup. With teams like this, the whole is clearly greater than the sum of the parts. In Iceland, they've got you know, a video, video maker in goal. They've got a plumber on the right wing. They've got one or two good players, but they work as a fused group, right? And that's what gives them their strength. It's no accident that when Jean-Paul Sartre was trying to think about the nature of organization, he turned to football. It's very good on this, Sartre. The free action or activity of the individual player is subordinated to the team both integrated into it and transcending it, where the collective action of the group permits the refinement of individual action through the immersion into the organizational structure of the team. I'll, I'll skip that bit, it's a bit complicated. 
that Sartre's point is very simple. He's thinking about the nature of organization and the way in which in a team, an individual is subsumed into a unit, an organized unit, a team, and thereby trans can be part of that unit and also is, finds individual expression within that unit would be greater than his own individual expression. So if we're thinking about the nature of organizations, then football is a very good place to start. So football is collaborative, essentially collaborative, and that extends to patterns of sociability amongst the players and the contrast between a team that plays for each other and the team where each player plays for itself. The, the Lionel Messi versus Cristiano Ronaldo dialectic, right? So Messi is a very good example of an extraordinarily gifted player who's subsumed into the team identity of Barcelona, whereas Ronaldo is a brilliant player, great abs. But in a sense, the way Real Madrid is set up is to feed him the ball so he scores goals. Right? It's lovely to see. I hate Real Madrid, but there we go. To be clear, I'm talking about the formal sociability of a team as a functioning unit, an effective interactive grid. If a team plays well together on the pitch, then they might get along pretty well together off the pitch, but not necessarily. Some of the players in the World Cup winning French team of 1998 apparently never talked off the pitch. And the, the great Eric Cantona was apparently not that sociable when he totally defined the style of Manchester United's Premier League domination of the 1990s. And with the increasing multilingualism and cultural range from which players are drawn, let alone how young they are, I wonder what they talk about and what they have in common. You sort of think, what do they talk about? These young, very well-paid men very often. But what matters is the formality of the common football language they speak when they play together. These patterns of sociability both find their echo and their energy in the collective life of the fans. And it's the fans that really interest me. I'll come back to that in the book length thing that this is part of, which has good pictures in. The sociability extends to the very name of the sport that we're talking about. We're talking about association football. Association football, which abbreviates in the United States to soccer, association soccer and which is commonly misunderstood as an Americanism. When I was growing up, we used soccer and football fairly interchangeably. In the last 20, 30 years, the assumption has grown up that football is what you really call it, and soccer is kind of stupid. That's not true. Actually, soccer has within it the idea of association, and that's really what is important. Football is the movement of the socius the free association of human beings, as Marx said in Capital, although sadly he wasn't talking about football. The reason why football is so important to so many of us is precisely because of the experience of association at its heart and the vivid sense of community that it provides. To push this further, to go out on a limb, we might say that the proper political form of football is socialism. That's my claim. Freedom is not experienced apart from others, but only in and through association, where collective action both integrates and elevates individual action. That's how I understand socialism. To quote Bill Shankly once again, but you can find similar sen sentiments in the great Brazilian legend Socrates, who died uh, last year, or the Marxist West German 1974 World Cup winner, Paul Breitner, or indeed the former Argentinian captain, uh, Javier Zanetti. But to quote Shankly, the socialism I believe in is not really politics. It's a way of living, it's humanity. I believe the way to live and to be truly successful is by collective effort with everyone working for each other, everyone helping each other, and everyone having a share of the rewards at the end of the day. That's Shankly. Brian Clough who was a regular on picket lines during the miners' strike in England in the 1980s, said, for me, socialism comes from the heart. I don't see why certain sections of the community used to have the, sh the franchise on champagne and big houses. And the majority of premiership clubs and clubs elsewhere have their roots often in a pub or a club or a local church, a kind of association. So that link is deep. 
So there's this, you know, idea, silly idea that Margaret Thatcher popularised that there is no such thing as society. Well, there is in football. Now, this is a stupid thing to say, right? The form of football is socialism. Think about the autocracy and the sump of corruption that is FIFA, football's governing body based in the bourgeois comfort of Zurich. But such sentimentality also seems laughable because the massive and increasing influence of money in football, where players are encouraged, in many places compelled by greedy agents to act like mercenaries, and clubs are the playthings of the super rich and powerful where the devotion of fans is greedily monetized and loyalty is taken for granted at every conceivable moment. And here is perhaps the most basic contradiction of football. Its form is association, the sociability and collective action of players and fans. Yet its material substrate is money, dirty money, often from highly questionable, under-scrutinized sources. Football is completely commodified, saturated in sponsorship and the most vulgar and stupid branding. Think of the endless advertisements during the Champions League, Heineken in the US, Gazprom in Russia, and so on. And the omnipresence of FIFA's World Cup sponsors, who are McDonald's and Budweiser, those brands long associated with football. It's a monetized and sometimes unbearable spectacle of whatever period of capitalism we're trying to survive through. It can be hideous. <laughs> but to go, just like the nice song, I like that. It, but to quote Johan Cruyff again, why couldn't you be a richer club? I've never seen a bag of money score a goal. Perhaps what brings us together as spectators and lovers of the game is the simultaneous truth and untruth of Cruyff's sentiment. On the one hand, we require a vigorous and rigorous critique of the corrupt transnational corporate structure of football. This could be achieved through a Marxist analysis of capital flows or a Foucaultian analysis that would link to the connection between football and violence, football and war, football and colonialism, football and racism, football and forms of retrograde and atavistic nationalism. And the need for such a critique is utterly urgent with the extremely depressing prospect of the next two World Cups being played in Russia and Qatar, and both of those deals were the consequence of evident corruption and bribery, as was the case with basically all the World Cups in the last 20, 30 years. But, so football is horrible. If you want an image of our world at its worst and ugliest, you turn to football, the dirty money. But, on the other hand, football also requires a poetics, more focused on form, that can attempt to evoke its more powerful and deeply moving beauty. As the Argentine coach Marcelo Bielsa, an inspiration for Maurizio Pochettino, to, to some, and like, but to others, a kind of mad genius. But uh, Bielsa makes this remark, which I found, where he says, the essence of football is a gesture at the service of beauty. A gesture at the service of beauty. For there is beauty here. The beauty of the players, the effusive green of the grass, intersected with crisp, geometrical white lines. The beauty of the ever-shifting shapes interconnecting, interlocking movements, dynamic grids and nodal formations on the pitch, and the beauty of the banners and the flags waved by the fans, and the sound and the force and the rhythm of their songs. And there is grace, an unforced and untimed, unwilled movement and elegance. I guess what interests me, what interests many of us, is the grace that some players have. You think about Zidane. There's a wonderful movie made from 2006 by Douglas Gordon and Philippe Pareno called Zidane, Portrait of the 21st Century. If you've not seen it, please watch it. You just watch Zidane move. Not the fastest player, right? Never the fastest player, but one of the most graceful and who could always find space. Or you think about a player like Roberto Baggio, 
o Paolo Maldini, Thierry Henry, Andrea Pello, Andres Iniesta. Uh, there's a grace that these individuals have, an astonishing capacity. But also think about the grace of an entire team. Say, for example, with all due apologies and respect to uh, Brazilians in the audience, Germany's 7-1 destruction of Brazil in the 2014 World Cup. If you watch, say, a 10-minute edit of that, and it's well worth doing, what's so beautiful about the German play is its simplicity. Control and pass, control and pass, control, pass, move, control, pass, move, then basically the goals are, is a cipher, right? And that Brazilian defense had no idea what was happening. And what was the beauty of that was the simplicity of it. So I'll be given the five minutes. I'll just fall oh, back. I'm back. Uh, my basic point, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, fans and non-fans alike, is that everything that I want to be true philosophically is true of football. The problem is, is that it's only true of football. And the world is kind of rubbish. But for that moment, when you're watching a game with other people and you're in a virtual or a real relationship with them and you're engaged in this spectacle, then something marvelous happens. And what's marvelous is both that sense of what I was calling in the talk socialism, sociability, of belonging, which doesn't mean that we're through with hatred and violence and all that's still there, um, but we can. We can, we can sublimate it. We don't actually start killing each other. And uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the fact that all of this is made possible through, through money. So again, what I think is important about football is you can't just feel good about it. Right? You feel good about it in some complicated way. It's why it feels like a dirty pleasure. You're watching this, you love this, and you know what's making this possible. You know the kind of dirty stuff that's making this whole thing possible. And that gives us, I think, this is my concluding, concluding words, a kind of image of our world. Both the, the horror of where we are, but also what's great about it. And that human beings acting together in concert, acting together uh, in unity, can do things uh, which are decent, honorable, and good, despite the shit show we're living through. And that's one of the reasons I like football. Thank you very much and good night.